This is Long Beach, California, and the reason I'm here isn't to look for Snoop Dogg or take in the aquarium. No, it is far cooler even than that, because somewhere on one of the floors above me is cycling's very own virtual reality playground. This is the home of Zwift, and we are getting a total exclusive because they very kindly invite us over to take a look behind the scenes. And hopefully, when I get down from my wall, I might even be able to do a bit of indoor cycling as well. Hey. Hey, Simon. Welcome to Zwift HQ. Thanks, man. Cheers. How's the ride? Yeah, it's good. It's awesome. Right. Awesome. Well, rack your bike and we'll cool. get you into the showers. Thanks. So this is where it all happens. Although, if I'm being completely honest, I'm not entirely sure what it actually is because Zwift shares as much of its DNA with the computer games industry as it does with the bike industry. So I am kind of in new territory here. But there are a lot of similarities as well. We still have our team of designers, and then we've still got our team of engineers that helped put the design into practice. And then, of course, we finish it all up with the product testing team as well. But we are gonna start at the beginning with this man in here, who is effectively the games master. John, how are you doing? Hey. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. So, John, it's fair to say, is actually the man who invented Zwift. And it existed for quite a long time before people like me were actually able to use it. You had it for your own personal use, is that right? It did. I started it. Uh, started writing some software in 2010 in the winter. As soon as daylight savings hit, uh, it was a it was a double whammy. I had a newborn baby. Daylight savings hit. I wanted to continue riding. Got a trainer. Was bored to tears on the first ride. And uh, being from the video game industry for 15 years at that time. I figured there was probably a better way and uh, started writing something. Within a week, I was, I was off and running and riding around in a world. So, so what does Zwift version one actually look like then? So the first version, I was actually, it was, it was solo. As a one man programmer, uh, programming team, I couldn't really do a full online world. So this was one rider in a world full of uh, trees and, and butterflies and, and uh, wilderness. And so, how does it get then from being something that you have developed for yourself personally to actually becoming a business? Where did Zwift then come from? So I had been kind of planning to do a Kickstarter over the years um, and had been trying to drum up a little bit of interest. I was posting screenshots on the internet, specifically Slow Twitch, which is a triathlon uh, web forum. And that is when Eric Min, the CEO of Zwift, saw a post. He was trying to do something similar. He was trying to, to get together a team. He saw what I had been posting, uh, and it was right up, right up his alley. So he flew over to Los Angeles from London. I gave him a demo, and two months later, Zwift existed. No way. And and at what point then did it go from being like a single player platform to this kind of the social thing that it is? You know, we've experienced it firsthand at, at GCN. You know, when a race ends void back in the early days. Uh, so what? You know, when did that happen? Uh, well, that was the plan from day one of Zwift being formed. It was going to be a social interactive thing. So that just took a little bit of, um, you know, hiring and having the funds to actually hire some people to build servers and, you know, infrastructure. And it takes, you know, several more programmers than just me. Yes, yeah, so we, we kind of experienced that social thing early on with where we raced Jens Voigt. And, you know, he was in America and we were in the UK, but we still had this cool head to head race. You know, it was great. For you, it was great. For him, I still hear he's really annoyed about the outcome of that uh, event. I think there's going to have to be a rematch for this. A rematch? Well, we're pretty game on GCN. You know, me and Dan, we could, we could take Jens again. So one of the first things you notice when you are riding in Zwift is probably the depth and the detail of the 3D environment that you're surrounded by. And so these are the guys that actually make that happen. So this is like the graphics team. And Tony here is one of the 3D artists. Hey, Tony. Hi. Now, you are working flat out at the minute, right? Because you've got something pretty important that's about to launch. Can you give us a sneak peek? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, is, that, is that a volcano? 
Tony. <laughs> yeah, it's uh You guys have just on. built yourself a volcano. That is cool. I suppose one of the things that you can do in a virtual world for cycling is create stuff that clearly you could never ride anywhere near. So that is actually really cool. How long does it take you to do this? Because I suppose one of the things that that Zwift has done in the past obviously, is create like the Richmond World course mm -hmm. and then the Ride London course. Mm -hmm. But that must be incredibly time consuming to, to effectively draw a city. Yeah, yeah it definitely is. Uh, since this is a smaller expansion, um, I think we've been working on this a little over a month. Wow. But Richmond and uh, London took months. Yeah. <laughs> took a lot longer. Right, so next on our list are the programmers. Now these guys are also working flat out at the minute because they're currently in the final stages of releasing iOS compatible Zwift. So that is Zwift on your iPhone and your iPad. But then of course you've got to remember that this is the team that's also responsible for delivering some of the unique features already on Zwift, like the cycling dynamics. And I gather this man here, Dan, was the one that was largely responsible for delivering exactly that. Dan, hi. How are you doing? All right, nice to meet you. So, I gather you are the one that was in charge of, of cycling dynamics, peloton dynamics, if you like. Right. So I, I don't know a great deal about, about computer game programming. So perhaps you can kind of distill down exactly how you did that and, and made Zwift feel kind of realistic effectively to cyclists. You know, you have to kind of look at it from two perspectives, from both, uh, you know, trying to replicate sort of the, the peloton, the pack dynamics of a real life peloton. Uh, of course, we don't have control of the speed of the riders, they're in control of the speed, but we're in control of the steering and um, you know, whether they're going to be passing or drafting. And You work all of that into a system where um, you know, it's kind of almost like working with the rider in terms of you know, he's sort of controlling his speed and then you have to interpret like if he's slowing down behind somebody, then you know, does he want to tuck in and draft that person? So we bring him in. And, and draft them, and we do some. You know, we try and uh, anticipate what the uh, what the rider is actually trying to do. Yeah, and and the you mentioned drafting there. So you were also responsible for for factoring in how much easier it is to sit behind someone on Zwift. Is that right? Right. Um, you know, I, I was both in control of kind of the pack dynamics and, and having guys get into position for drafting it while, and setting up draft lines, but also uh, just the the raw calculations of drafting and, and doing a simulation of you know how the drafting works and getting into a draft and. You know, there's there's not a lot of white papers on that kind of thing, but uh, you, yeah. know, you, you know, if you do enough digging, you can find uh, find some decent information. Finally, one thing I really want to talk to you about. I gather that you were responsible for delivering one of my favorite all-time computer games, which is Road Rash, the motorbike racing game. There's a key feature on there where, when you're riding, you can basically beat up your opponents, punch them, kick them, maybe hit them with a chain. Right. You ever tempted to kind of? Maybe build something like that into Zwift, just the ability to headbutt or, you know. There's, there's always this little, you know, quiet talk amongst, you know, the programmers and artists and, you know, maybe throw in an animation here and there of a kick and maybe have some secret code for being able to unlock it and be able to do it. And of course, you know, only the developers would know about it. So we'd go out there kicking people around. So if, if anyone ever rides past you on Zwift and gives you a kick, you know it's probably one of you guys right. and you've got some <laughs> super Jedi uh, cheat function. Right, well, there you go. Sure. Good stuff. Well, I'll let you get back to it, Dan. Thanks very much for talking to us. Yeah. So once our designers have designed and our programmers have programmed, we then move on to this team here. These guys are quality assurance. So they're like our product testers, if you like. And although nothing is physically being destroyed here, there is no carbon being broken. If you listen carefully, you may well hear the sound of computers actually screaming. Because in here, it's just about every device going because they need to make sure that Zwift works perfectly on all of them. But then, of course, it's not just about your device. There's also the hardware element as well. Now, if you come in to their test lab here, Zwift don't actually make trainers, but what they had to do was make sure that it worked with almost all home trainers available on the market. And they know that it works with them all because in here, they actually have all of them. And I mean literally all of them. It's particularly important for smart trainers to be able to interact correctly with Zwift to make sure you get the best possible experience, translating the virtual into the real. But then of course, you don't need a smart trainer, you can use a much simpler trainer and that's still gonna work. And that's predominantly down to the research that Zwift have done into estimating the power curves of trainers. So effectively, being able to work out how much power you're putting out simply through the velocity of your back wheel. Now you might be wondering why there is a giant pile of kids' toys 
in the middle of Zwift's HQ? And it's a pretty good question, really. And the reason is, is that actually Zwift ran a competition the other month whereby if you completed a certain amount of miles on a big wheeler in Zwift itself, then you're entered into a draw where you could potentially come out to Long Beach, California and help present a hundred of these kids' big wheelers to a local children's charity, which sounds like a super cool initiative if you ask me. Right, it's time to do some riding now because Scott here wants to talk me through workout mode, which is the more training specific option that exists on Zwift and has done for some time now, right? But it's not something that I'm overly familiar with. So what, what are we looking at here? Well, before we dive too deeply into this, Simon, we have a special treat for you today, which is right over there. That, that looks like a treadmill, but it doesn't look big enough to ride on. I, I, don't, I don't really do running so much, but... Uh... Well, I, I, I suppose we'll come back to workout mode in, in a future video because I suppose I've got a, a point with a treadmill. Well, I've found a personal use for running mode, cyclocross training mode. Now, it does feel like what we've seen here today is just the tip of the iceberg, so there'll be more content to follow in the coming months, just as soon as Jens names his date. And if you want to be in the right place to see that rematch when it comes, do make sure you subscribe to GCN. To do that, just click on the globe. Or if you want to see the original Jens Voigt race, then you can click just up there. Or to see the live Richmond race that we streamed on GCN, click just down there. Right, got us to some intervals.